ओम ज्ञान तिरंधस्य ज्ञानं जन समाकर चक्षुर मिलितम येन तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः Tonight's lecture is in English so आप जो अंग्रेजी नहीं समझते तो बैठ के बीच बीच कृष्णा गौरांग इत्यादि नाम सुन के लाभवान होंगे और सब जो हम कहेंगे वो कृष्ण कथा होगी नहीं समझ के भी फायदा होगा so yes we're it's in english uh this evening i'm just going to speak on a few unrelated points some are connected to lectures i gave previously the last lecture i gave the subject was sickness and there was an important point which as far as i remember i didn't make or i didn't make it very clear that as far as cure is concerned ultimately it's up to krishna no doctor no medicine no hospital no treatment can guarantee a cure or any, even if there is a cure it's all up to krishna just two days ago i was speaking with a doctor who regularly comes here and he was expressing this that we are i can understand that we can on we can only assist or we can only <coughs> yeah that was those what he used assist but the sense is that ultimately it's up to krishna whether anyone gets cured or not he said most doctors think that they are curing one doctor i went to see with him he said i saw this picture of krishna so i pointed that out in his office there's a picture of krishna so I, this is also two days ago <coughs> and he said yes we are vaishnavas and then talking of in gujarat vaishnava that generally means attached to the vallabh sampradaya so there was some talk and he was talking about kankroli so i asked him are you under the kankroli goswamis he said we're not under anyone they're all our patients so he was thinking that he is curing but a more intelligent doctor understands that just like krishna had arjuna fight and he told arjuna nimitta matram bhavasya sachin you can simply be the instrument by which this is affected so the doctor can simply be the instrument and the sickness cure no cure it's all up to krishna it's all in krishna's hands it's impossible cases no hope of survival they can survive there are so many so many cases like that again two days ago this doctor he was happened to be in indore at the time when a god brother of mine whom i've known since practically since i joined mahaman prabhu who's indian body but was uh, studying from uganda i think it was and was studying in england he joined is gone in england so he was in a serious car crash so this doctor in indore so this doctor told him if you see the car you couldn't believe that anyone could have survived the crash but by krishna's grace he survived whereas sometimes you'll find someone that there's no they seem to be quite healthy and then they just die there was in in haridaspur where we have an iskon center this is many years ago it was maybe 30 years ago i was told there was one young grihastha devotee who was serving in the temple there young means maybe 30 years like that so he 
just one day he suddenly thought, oh, I have a serious stomach ache. He said, oh. he went to the hospital. Before he reached the hospital, he was dead. There's no sign of anything. May have been gastroenteritis. May have been. Who's had gastroenteritis? I know. It's very, comes very suddenly and it's very painful. So it's uh, ultimately in the hands of Krishna at that point I wanted to make. Then uh, another point. Oops, I'm going too far here. Now it's the month of Damoda, in which. Oh, there's a cobweb. I can see the shadow. So I'd like to be the Nimitta Matram for getting someone to clean it. Who wants to? If we don't do it now, we're going to forget. Can someone go get a brush? Or clean? It looks very big. It's probably not so big. It's magnified by the by the light, huh? Hmm? It's only a net. It's not a cobweb. What kind of net is it that hangs? To? Spider's web. Yeah, it's called a cobweb. It's another word in English. Yeah, it, if it's only a spider's web. Well, it should be cleaned up. Okay, I did some devotional service today. At last, did something. So, in the month of Damodari, we like to think about Krishna. Actually, always we should think about Krishna, but especially Krishna's Childhood pastimes. And many devotees, especially those living in India, but from all over the world, many devotees go to live in Vrindavan during Kartik or visit at least for a few days. So, considering Vrindavan, it is Vrindavana Ramya Sthan, Dibdo Chintamani Dham. It is very beautiful place, transcendental, abode of the Lord. <clears throat> and in many ways, well, first I should say, <laughs> it's enriched by the lotus feet of Krishna. His, he performed so many pastimes there. Or, in the words of Srila Bhaktivin or Thako, uh, mm, what is that? Radha Padankata Dham Jaranam Vrindavan. If, if devotees like Bhaktivin or Thako, who Amito Radhika Pokkapati Shoda, he's in the camp of Radharani. So it's in, he sees it, Vrindavan, the special glory of Vrindavan, that it's enriched by the lotus feet of Radharani. So Radha and Krishna and all their devotees performed wonderful pastimes there 5,000 years ago in our terrestrial perception, which is just a squeak, a blip in cosmic time. But since that time, especially since the time of Lord Chaitanya, Vrindavan has been even more enriched. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent the six Goswamis to Vrindavan for one of the important purposes they had to perform. There was Lupta Tirta Udha. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu specifically told Sanatana Goswami to find out the lost holy places. All of Vrindavan is holy, but there are certain pastime places of Krishna. If you go to Vrindavan, you can take Prabhupada's Krishna book, and you can go, for instance, to Kaliya Ghat, and read there about how Krishna <coughs> chastised Kaliya. You can go to Brahmanda Ghat, and go to the actual place where Mother Yashoda saw the universe within Krishna's mouth. 
So there were so many pastime places of Krishna which were lost or not well known and the, the six Goswamis and later others, they discovered and played these and established temples there. And particularly since the time of Lord Chaitanya, so many great devotees have lived in Vrindavan and <coughs> performed bhajan there and established temples and their samadhis are there. So in, in one sense, Vrindavan is even more transcendentally rich than when Krishna was personally there. Krishna is always there. What is that? Uh, Vrindavanam Nagachati. How does that go? Vrindavanam Nagachati. Vrindavanam Parityaja Napada Mekam Gachati. Krishna never goes even one step outside Vrindavan. So Krishna is always there, but he, manif- he manifested his pastimes 5,000 years ago, and since that time it's even more enriched by so many great devotees. We can also visit their temples and their samadhis and by their performing bhajan there they made Vrindavan even more rich. So that's a great facility of living in India. We can visit Vrindavan. I haven't been this year. Uh, In Mayapur and so many holy places. And these temples established by Srila Prabhupada and his followers, they're also replicas of Vrindavan. So even if we can't physically go to Vrindavan, if we, we can come to the temple and have darshan of the Lord and chant his holy names and hear about him. And most important, we should, uh, by the practice of bhakti yoga, under the guidance of Krishna's devotees, make our hearts pure or or follow the process of bhakti yoga by which our hearts will become pure. Make our heart a temple. Recently I was in Vapi in South Gujarat and land has been given there for making a temple of Iskon. So many people were asking me about that but I was repeatedly telling them that yes, Iskon can build a temple here, but most important is that everyone has to make a temple in their heart. Otherwise, what's the use of making a temple? There are so many temples in India. But most important, we have to make our hearts, or, or follow the process of Bhakti Yoga by which our hearts will become purified and a, a, a suitable place for Krishna to manifest his pastimes. Uh, then to another point, uh, just before I came back to India this year, I was in Munich in Germany, and I uh, spoke on sentiment, of feelings and philosophy in devotional service, feelings and philosophical understanding. Uh, just little point to add to that, that apart from feelings and philosophical understanding in devotional service, apart from being in devotional service, that both uh, reasoning or uh, a logical way of th- a re- uh, considered way of thinking on on one side and emotions and feelings on the other, apart from being in devotional service, they are intrinsic to the human condition, mm. and they cannot be one without the other. The if humans all have feelings and they have a reasoned process of thinking, even if the reasoning is what, 
just like most people would accept that the uh, the Nazi outlook on the Jewish race. They had a reason. Hitler wrote a book, Mein Kampf, describing his philosophy. He had a he had worked out some system by which he was able to convince others that the best thing you can do with a Jew is to kill them. So he had a reasoning. It was it's not uh, <laughs> very inhuman. But the reasoning process is there. That's the point I want to make. Even if it's uh, even if it's not very good reasoning or very sane reasoning. <clears throat> so that is there. And that distinguishes humans from lower animals that the the faculties of reasoning are much more developed than in lower species. Although in some lower species they can they have they can do things in a manner that is uh, more intelligent than humans. For for instance, how ants and bees cooperate much better than humans. Do. How certain birds' arctic turns, they navigate their way from the North Pole to the South Pole and back every year. Although they probably don't really think about what they're doing, but uh, certain experiments have been made to show that monkeys and certain other species can act in a reasonable or, or reasoned. They, they, they can, some level of intelligence is, is there. So both things, are, both reasoning and emotion are there in human beings and when one becomes when one becomes either lacking in feeling or or lacking in reasoning then one is considered insane if one is lacking in feeling just like the nazis of germany they seem very sane they were very ordered and deliberate in what they were doing but it was uh, so inhuman as to be could be considered one form of insanity to be so feelingless There's, a few years ago in England a, a doctor was convicted for having killed so many of his patients I'm just giving you a little injection here don't worry it'll be alright and then they die and when he done more than 200 like that they found out so that's called cold blooded murder so it's it's almost like a kind of insanity it means the, the feelings are so blunt and hard that people become so insensitive and cruel that they're considered inhuman. Of course, although many people talk a lot about human rights, but they don't have any feeling for the animals. They, they make such a big thing out of human rights. And they'll even bomb and invade countries and blow people up to establish human rights. The great gift to Iraq of we're giving you human rights and we just have to kill a you know, few lakh Iraqis and totally devastate the country. But don't worry, it's all for the sake of human rights. But they don't consider that how many animals are they killing? Millions. That's also pain and suffering. Unnecessary. 
It's not that, it's not that meat food is required. So that's also inhuman cruelty. And of course, if someone is, if their reasoning faculty is uh, seriously impaired, then they're also insane. So that's an addenda to that point. Uh, then, going to another point altogether. Oh, about Kirtan. Yesterday I was, I, I read for the first time one in, uh, an article by Srila Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati from his pre sannyas days. This is about 1915, something like that, almost a hundred years ago. Gane Adhikari K, who is qualified to sing? So generally you would think, well, who's qualified to sing? Well, anyone can sing. Ah, 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 ah. Anyone can sing. But who is qualified to sing for Krishna? So he was making the point that it's it's not simply a matter of rag, tal, man, and loy. Which means, raga means, what's the English translation of raga? Rhythm. Hmm? No, no, rhythm is tau. Tunes, I guess, yeah, tune, I guess we can say. Hmm? Loy is tempo. And man is what? What does that mean in this context? Like the, the feeling, is it? Or? I don't know what it means actually in this context. Anyway, he's not saying, he said it's not a matter of musical ability, but one who is singing to please Krishna. That's the point. Kirtan means to glorify Krishna. And many times the singers, they uh, sing to glorify themselves. So that's not very good. Mm. Professional musicians, they can sing with a lot of feeling. I remember somewhere, maybe I was in an airport or something, I saw there was, they had some TV on. This was in the West. And there was a performance of someone singing and playing a, an organ. It was obviously he wasn't singing, he was just pretending to sing. Miming. And at first I was watching, I was wondering, is this supposed to be a joke or a comedy or what? Because he, he was like this with so much feeling. It was one of those songs which makes you makes you want to cry or something like that. But obviously he was miming and he wasn't really singing. And I was thinking, is it a joke or what? Then I thought, no, actually it's just a performance. He's just and everyone knows he's just pretending to to sing, but he's apparently singing with a lot of feeling, but everyone can see he's not singing at all. So what's the feeling if he's not singing at all? He's just pretending. So like that, it's a performance. And many songs can... They... they well... Music is supposed to elicit some emotion, isn't it, generally? I mean, some music they have in the West called techno rock, and it has any emotion. You know what that is? You hear it, boom, boom, boom. It's just like, boom, boom. It just goes on like that. It's not even, not even a double beat. It's just a single, boom, 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 boom. Like that. It's for intoxicated people to dance. Very loud and very unmusical, and it's generated from a computer. But most music is supposed to emo evoke some emotion. So professional performers, 
they do that. And with kirtan also, there can be uh, expert singers who, the way they sing, they, they, it sounds like there's so much feeling that you, know, you want to cry or they think, wow, that's really, so much feeling. They must be pure devotees. But actually, they're just like professional performers. They're, they're singing, they're practiced to sing like that. And you can see how much feeling is there by what they do after the kirtan stops. And what they say and how they act after the kirtan stops. I've many times told my experiencing professional performers in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh and in West Bengal. In Bangladesh it's more popular. They have uh, professional, well they, the idea is that they have kirtan performances. Ashta Prahar means one day, or sometimes two days, three days, or if they really want to get into it, seven days. Now these were originally the non-stop kirtan. Usually Hare Krishna, sometimes some totally bogus mantra, usually Hare Krishna Kirtan. So, uh, originally this was organized and local people themselves would perform the Kirtan. But later it became a, they, professional groups. They travel around and they are hired to sing. And they're good musicians. I mean, some of the Madanga players, I mean, they're really, really very expert. So, uh, they're hired to sing, and usually they, they have two hour shifts. So the ones, that if you go like four to six in the morning, they, they're usually, I, they don't put much energy into it. They're probably tired themselves and everyone else is sleeping. Or they're supposed to be listening. But when there's lots of people and everyone's for then they get, then they really get into it and they put in a good performance. <coughs> but you see, sometimes after their two hours are over, the next group's not ready. They didn't put their ankle bells on or they had to be woken up or they're finishing their last bidi before they go on. <coughs> whatever, they come in late and you'll see the, the group who's, they have to, because the kirtan shouldn't stop, right? So, they're going on, but they're just doing a very formal, and once they go past their two hours, they're doing a very formal way. And they're getting, you can see they're getting angry. What, you know, they don't wear watches. You know, come on, our time's up. You know, we want to go. You didn't smoke for two hours, it's too much, you know. They, then they have the widows get do the biddy saver, they come and as soon as they're finished, they're <sighs> after two hours, and that's a great austerity for them to go two hours. So they're there, and then, then the group comes on like 10, 15 minutes late, and, and the one that's in there, they can't, while they're they can't, you know, why they come late, and not very happy with them, so it's not that they're performing kirtan out of bliss or ecstasy, it's a job and they can uh, make the feeling like the like the professional performer I was seeing on TV it's a show it, it doesn't come from the heart it's out of a performance so <clears throat> oh, I wrote a whole bunch of stuff about this. Yeah, if you're paid, you can sing with feeling about anything. Yeah. People sing with feeling about their country. Maybe the most rubbish country in the world. Oh. There's a national anthem for every country. And in, in, in most countries, you're supposed to stand up when the national anthem is played and salute the flag, and they made all this ceremony.
then after some time someone will come and conquer the country and then divide it up and there won't be any country. Then you're supposed to sing the national anthem to the new country, whatever. Just like Iraq, when when the Americans finally get out of there, then it'll it'll divide up into a few countries, maybe probably, and who knows? And then there won't be any Iraqi national anthem. Or, what is this country? It's all just an imagination. So that feeling of that bhav. It's not, there may be some feeling that devotees are singing in, in such a way that it evokes some feeling. But the feeling that they're feeling by playing in such a, or, or singing and playing in such an evocative manner, it may be feeling, but it's not actually pure devotion for Krishna. The idea is that art, I was saying music, but all art is supposed to evoke some feeling. That's what art does. Evoke some kind of feeling. So for the artist, the feeling is important, not the subject. For the devotee, Krishna is important. Because it's Krishna we have feeling for Krishna. We're supposed to have feeling for Krishna. Who's a devotee has feeling for Krishna. But for the artist, it's the feeling. It doesn't matter. That's why, that's why these, uh, the Mayavadis, they say, well, it doesn't matter which god you worship as long as you have bhakti. The main thing is the bhakti. So you worship any god. And what you feel. But no, it's for Krishna. We want Krishna. We don't... We respect Shiva, Brahma and all, but only in relation to Krishna. We're not going to offer our heart's feelings and fully surrender in all respects to Brahma or Shiva or anyone else. Only to Krishna. So Krishna is the subject. It's not that because we're trying to evoke some feeling, because when I evoke the feeling, then, then it makes me feel good. That's maya. That's not bhakti. Just like we find that among Bengali, not, not only Bengali, but I just happen to know something about Bengali culture, maybe more than other parts of India, but generally in India we'll find poets, they, 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 of course there are many directly devotional poets who only write about Krishna. There are others who are just poets. And sometimes they write about Krishna also. Just like the first Nobel Prize winner from India was Rabindranath Tagore. Ki Jai! What a great honor that the, the meat eaters and cow killers are giving you a prize. Be proud. Now there's a new Indian Nobel Prize winner. And he studied in Vadodara. How wonderful. I'm being sarcastic. Just in case. You didn't get the point. So, Ravi Tagore, he wrote so many poems, and he also wrote some poems about Krishna, and his poems, so we're told, are very expressive and beautiful and evocative and this and that and wonderful and he got a Nobel Prize. So his poems about Krishna also sound very nice. But he's not a devotee of Krishna. It's just that sometimes, because the culture in Bengal, Krishna is a prominent figure. So he wrote about so many things and he also wrote something about Krishna and it might sound that he has a lot of feeling for Krishna but he has a lot of feeling apparently for many things which he expresses but that feeling is an artist's feeling it's not a devotee's feeling it's not bhakti so we don't recite poems by Rabi Tagore or Kazi Nazrul Islam another famous poet of Bengal also wrote about Krishna sometimes it doesn't mean he's a devotee of Krishna some feeling for Krishna is there but like I say for the artist the feeling is important for the devotee, Krishna is important. For the musician, music is important. 
how nicely they can sing, how high they can go, how uh, how uh, beautifully they can express it. So yeah, all right, yeah, we want Krishna should be praised by all all the best art should be for Krishna. All the the best music, the best songs, the best poetry, the best food, the best buildings and architecture and paintings and Krishna should, we should dress him in the nicest possible manner. Everything should be nice for Krishna. But that's the point. Everything should be nice for Krishna. And if we're simply musicians or expert in music, but we don't have the central point of our life, how to please Krishna, then we may be very good musical performers, but that is not bhakti. And bhakti can be overshadowed by the uh, desire or, or, or the, fo- the desire to be known as a good artist or musician. And it can be overshadowed by technique. We become more interested in technique and how we can sing nicely and play musical instruments. So, that feeling that is evoked by music, even if the subject is Krishna, the feeling that can be, the, the feeling or the, can be mundane if we put more emphasis on the artistic ability, if we put more emphasis on the feeling, than on serving and pleasing Krishna. So the music may be very evocative and someone may be an expert singer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are pure devotee. They might be a pure devotee. It doesn't mean they're not a pure devotee also. But we can't judge, or we can't uh, uh, consider, we shouldn't consider that someone's a pure devotee, just because they sound as if they have a lot of feeling. They may have a lot of feeling. (laughs) And the subject might be Krishna, but still, because their outlook is mundane, those feelings are not pure. Understand that? That, that, that? There may be strong feelings, apparently, for Krishna. But it can, it's only a reflection of actual feeling for Krishna, which comes from someone who's completely surrendered to Krishna. That's described by Rupa Goswami in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. The uh, Pratibhimba Ratya Bhas. The, it's a reflection of real feeling for Krishna. Reflection looks like the same thing, but it isn't. So as described in my book on Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, the Bhakti Vinod Thakur once met with the so-called Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who appeared to have lots of feeling when he, when he, when the Ramakrishna so-called Paramahamsa met Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and knowing that Bhakti Vinod Thakur was known as a great devotee of Krishna, so Ram Krishna exhibited some ecstasy in relation to Krishna, but Bhakti Nautako wasn't impressed. <laughs> then they offered the so-called Paramahamsa some rasagula, which he took a little and distributed to others. Then they offered him some amedya, which can mean meat or wine or and he hesitated a little, then he took it, because he sees everything as one, or whatever, whatever his perverted reasoning is. So Bhakti Nautako, he left that place and went to his own place, and then he dilated on this perverted manifestation. One is a reflection, and there's also a perversion, 
Reflection may not be so bad. Perversion is very bad. So, for Ravi Tagore and others, Krishna is just another subject. One of many. And his object is artistic expression. But for a devotee, his subject is only Krishna. And his object is only to serve Krishna. That's all. There's a, there's a great difference. The feeling, one may be a good singer and with a lot, singing with a lot of feeling. But unless one is actually surrendered to Krishna, that, that feeling will be artificial if it simply depends on musical ability. So, Hare Krishna. Any questions about this or as I had a general general subjects, I guess I could take general questions for a few minutes also. Yes, please. Is there any facility to... Is there anyone online watching? They could also ask if they want. Yeah. Maharaj, you spoke about uh, feelings and uh, philosophical understanding. Yeah. So sometimes it happens to me when I come in front of beauty. I mean, it uh, happens to, like, feelings increases. Sometimes you, you have, somewhat intense devotional feelings. For instance, when you, sometimes when you go before the deity. Yeah. And uh, as far as it is concerned to philosophical understanding, I don't have much interest in that. You don't have much interest in, in philosophy. So how to take it to balance? How to make the balance? Well, you should be interested. Shidhanta Bolya Chitte Nakaroha Lash Iha Hoite Krishna Lage Suri Ramanash. Krishna Kaviraj Goswami says, Don't be lazy in trying to understand philosophy. For by doing so, by understanding conclusions of Shastra, one's mind becomes strongly attached to Krishna. So if we actually want to be strongly attached to Krishna, then we should try to understand Krishna as he describes himself in Bhagavad Gita, as all the Acharyas throughout time have described Krishna. We should try. Every devotee has to, has to understand at least the basic points. Otherwise, you'll find so many people, they'll come before a deity of Sai Baba and they'll have some feeling what is the meaning of that? That feeling will drive them to hell. So, feeling for Krishna, that is the, Krishna is the right object of our feeling. But if we don't properly understand who is Krishna and why we should serve him, then we can be easily diverted either from worship of Krishna or we can be diverted to some uh, form of worship of Krishna that is not approved by the Acharya. Shuti Smriti Purana Adi Pancharatra Vidhin Vina Aikantaki Hare Bhakti Utpata Yaiva Kalpate. We can be diverted into some so called bhakti which is not approved by Shastra, which is simply a disturbance in the actual practice of bhakti. Yeah. We have a question. Yeah. Who is this from? Sridhar Srinivas. Sridhar Srinivas. Yeah. Um, yeah. From Seattle. Is it okay for a devotee to practice on a specific devotee service? Is it okay for a devotee to? Focus. Focus on a specific devotional service? Among several services. Among several services. Or 
should we try? Or should we try to do as many services as to do as many services as possible? Well, obviously, there's a limit to the number of services you anyone can do. Krishna has many servitors, and <coughs> Hanuman can't serve like the gopis do, and the gopis can't serve as Hanuman does. <coughs> so it's sensible to do what we can do. It's uh, tempting to try to do more than we can do, but it's sensible to, uh, although desiring to do much, to act practically within what we can do. A great Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, he was able to inaugurate so many services by so many devotees and he made so many programs and so many plans and but he himself was quite focused in what he was doing. He wrote books, he traveled, he gave lectures, he met people. In the early days he would do everything but he would he was focused at that time also on writing. Even in nineteen sixty six when he was Starting Eskon, he spent a lot of time writing. Even then, he was writing. He was writing and doing what was required to start a fledgling movement. And he was quite focused. He had his classes three times a week, I think it was. He would meet people who were interested and preach to them. He would cook. He would serve prasadam, and then gradually he turned these things over to others. But Srila Prabhupada, although he was, he did many things, he would keep, in the early days he would keep accounts, but um, he, one reason he was able to be successful was he stuck to his program. In 1966 in New York, he, he found who were interested, the hippies, and he, he stuck to that program of preaching among them. He focused on that, although he uh, was able to gradually engage his disciples in many different things. He didn't uh, personally try to do many, many things. So, better to focus. That's a, this is a general question with a general answer. Each individual, obviously, their life and their service is different. Yeah, anything else? I'll take one more question. Uh, as you say that uh, about cruelty of Nazi and... Uh, cruelty of? Nazi and... Nazis, yeah. I give that example because I'm from the West. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's still prominent in the Western psyche. The, 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 the Nazi horrors the Nazi atrocities. It's very prominent in the Western consciousness. Do you find that? After, yeah, it's the word Nazi, it's like the, the greatest insult you could give to anyone. It's, although, uh, actually Stalin was, he killed more people than the Nazis did, his own people. And, the, the average nice, polite American is also uh, part of an ongoing holocaust. That's the holocaust is the word used for the, the Nazis' genocide of the, the Jews, especially the Jews, others also, Jews, homosexuals, and some others, I can't remember exactly, gypsies. Those three. Uh, so yeah, the Holocaust is going on. Millions of chickens killed every day. There must be at least a million chickens killed every day in India. If if the the population is how much? 110, 115 crores. 125. Huh? 125 crores. 
Okay, so if we if we take a conservative estimate that one chicken is killed for every thousand people in India every day, then we go up to uh, one and a quarter million chickens every day in India alone. That's a lot, isn't it? No, wait a minute. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so... Uh, my question is that... Uh, or maybe it's... Anyway, I... They may differ anyway, it's a lot of chickens, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, they may different themselves by Bhagavad Gita, Shlok, Kavashan, Sudhirnani, Dhaka, Sehidu, and the two. Who's defending themselves on the basis of Bhagavad Gita killing? They may argue like this. When the body's old and worn out. Well, that's what, that's what Prabhupada said. You can eat the, when the body's old and worn out, you let the animal die, then you eat the meat. But they're not doing that. They're taking young animals and killing them. Mm, yeah? Also in Seattle, Naveen Krishna. Yeah, then? Should a devotee sing for Krishna even if he is not a good singer? Should a devotee sing for Krishna even if he is not a good singer? You mean in terms of voice, tune, time, can't keep time. Uh, yeah, having said all that, that uh, it's not simply dependent on all these skills, I would also say that in general, someone who can sing in tune should leave the kirtan, who can keep time, because otherwise it's just like, who should cook the offering? Well, he's a great devotee, but every time he uh, burns the rice and puts too much salt in the sabji, and the uh, the chapatis are just, just like rubber car tires, so, and here's someone who's not such an expert cook. Oh, sorry, who's not such not such a great devotee, but they know they can cook very well. Uh, I'd probably put the one who's a good cook into the kitchen. They know what they're doing. They have the general idea they're doing it for Krishna. Because we want Krishna to be pleased also. So Krishna is pleased by devotion, but now if you feed him raw chapatis and burned rice, he might get indigestion also. Mother Yashoda might not be very pleased. What are you feeding my boy? So, uh, in the same way, as someone who's leading kirtan, they, they, they can't sing in tune, or their, their voice is off key. Better leave it to some, but often, Devotees who are most enthusiastic to leave kirtan, they can't understand that you know, they're, they're, their singing is off-key, out of tune, out of time. So, I myself find it suffering. And I can, maybe Krishna is more tolerant. Yeah, better leave it to someone who, who can sing. You know. In a, at least a, in a manner which is not grinding on the ears. It also doesn't mean that, that everyone who can sing nicely is that proves that they're not a good devotee. It doesn't mean that. Also, doesn't it, if they can sing. Nicely, according to what we can see, in musical terms, it, it doesn't mean that they're a great devotee. It doesn't mean that they're not a devotee either. It doesn't mean that they're pretending either. 